Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name. <clears throat> if, if we could have your attention for just a little bit, the fellowship's an important part of a fellowship meeting, but we, and we have a blended uh, youth choir that they felt like they've been challenged today and want to step up and sing, but I thought we might start this service with prayer. I'm just, I keep getting a lot of uh, prayer requests being turned in, and there's so much that the Lord can help us with, and it would be right and honorable to, to start this service with prayer and some of the needs. Uh, there's a sister from Moline, a sister Kaufman, who uh, needs our prayers. There's a, a sister from Arlinda Gallagher, uh, who needs our prayers, Sister Ashton Allison from uh, Warren Assembly facing colon surgery. A lot of people know Brother Bill Wallander in Louisville. Brother Wallander, gosh, he's got he's to be older than the hills. Um, Brother Wallander used to pilot the boat for Brother William Souter so in his Older years, Brother Souders bought a houseboat, and he named it the Blues Chaser, because he thought it would chase away the blues. And uh, just this week, I was going through some old papers, and I found my grandfather, Brother Arlander Goodwin's drawings, where he remodeled the Blues Chaser for Brother Souders when he first bought it. But Brother Bill Wallander was, was the pilot, I guess, of, of that houseboat a lot of the times, and he suffered a massive heart attack uh, there in the church in Louisville, and uh, we'd like to request prayer for him. I'm, I just know there's a lot of needs in every assembly, in every assembly, and there's a lot of doctors, but there's only one healer, and there is a great physician, there is a healing balm in Gilead, there is a great physician, and and we want the Lord to continue to be with us here and ask Him to let His Holy Spirit cover the rest of this meeting, these services. And so I think it would be good. Would you mind just bowing your heads with me in prayer as we start this service? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for grace, your mercy, your love upon us. We pray that you would touch all of the saints that are in need. So many needs, so many different places. And yet our God is able. You're a healer. You can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Lord, you are the great physician. You are the healer. You're the one who can do what needs to be done for Ashton Allison and for Arlen Gallagher, for Sister Kaufman, for Brother Bill Wallander. Lord, for, for needs, for situations in just about every assembly all through this body. Lord, there's cancers and sicknesses and chronic diseases. And yet there's a God in heaven who can intervene. There's a God in heaven whose grace is sufficient. There's one whose power is abundant and free. And I pray that you would help us, dear Lord, tonight. Praise your rich, mighty name, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise your name, dear Lord. Praise God.
Well, I humbly want to say that I'm so glad uh, to be in this place. I'm Brother Mbuga from Tororo. I, one of the people that trace my heritage all the way uh, from Brother Goodwin's ministry up to Brother William Sodas. Uh, Brother Goodwin came in, in Africa some 41 years ago and established this order, this message, and the spirit. And that changed that continent. 
when he, is, he set his feet in the country of Kenya, in the city of Nairobi. And uh, he preached the message, said the order, and the spirit that characterizes this body. And I'm glad I was part of that. And uh, I remember uh, when Brother Wondo had, had that church established, he sent one brother back home in Uganda. And uh, that brother, we uh, came in uh, because we were sent to find how we can have this kind of church in our country. And before that, that was 1979. Our country, Uganda, didn't have Pentecostal uh, churches operating because the president then was Idi Amin had closed all the churches. And I remember those, the church I belonged to, it had its headquarters in Kampala, and soldiers surrounded that church and fired bullets. But it found God, nobody was uh, killed, but it destroyed the piano. And that closed the chapter. And from that time, we used to meet in houses. Uh, you go in one by one because they could not uh, wait to see a group going in, they would arrest them. So we'd go in a house. Uh, after two minutes or three, four, five, another one goes in until we make a, a congregation of maybe 20, 30 people. And we have a church. We couldn't sing and uh, we couldn't pray loud, but we could read the Bible. And that went on until uh, the Liberation War when Amin was toppled and the civil government was established. That's, that's when we had an opportunity to again watch. But I thank God that before we could go back again to that Pentecostal uh, movement that we were in, the body of Christ was established. What I remember vividly, we were in the house or so, two people, and uh, 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 three, and the third one did not attend the meeting that time. After that meeting, uh, the brother that was sent by Brother Wondo to see how the work can start in Uganda, uh, encouraged us to begin moving around. And when we moved around, we got about 10 brothers. I said this in the Easter meeting. And these 10 brothers went to the source of the River Nile. And uh, that's where the work began from. Service began right at the bank of the River Nile. And uh, we didn't have a Bible stand, but Brother Thomas Owundo uh, put, placed his Bible on a big rock, and that was his Bible stand. And uh, every one of us, the 10 brothers, we sat from those small rocks, and he, he preached. He established his order. He, uh, he gave us the message that Brother Lloyd Goodwin 
had given him. And uh, the song, I, I keep repeating what I said in the Easter meeting, that went on, that touched me so much, was God is leading us on. Uh, or in the way we have never been before, I remember. And there are mountains to climb. There are valleys to cross. But before us, we can see an open door. And we sang that song for a long time. Some of us having our tears rolling down our cheek. But we're excited that we got something that we have never had before. We had what we have never had before. We enjoyed what we have never had, uh, enjoyed before. And that was the message, the spirit, and the order in this body. We didn't know that this would ever uh, grow and be big. But I want to stand here to testify that what was started just by the bank of the river, Ohio River, I mean, I keep remembering Ohio, it, it got so stuck in my mind, Ohio River, uh, but the River Nile. Ten brothers seated on the, ro on the rocks, and today, like Brahman was saying, uh, talking about the upcoming meeting, when Brother Guduni came, he met thousands. What a wonderful work. A thousand, over a thousand. I call the meeting at the source of the Nile one of the greatest meetings I ever had of only ten brothers. But God has been so gracious that out of the ten, we have had great meetings. And of recently, during Easter, we had one of the greatest meetings. And that meeting, Brother Gooden, I want to thank you so much. Uh, it brought hope because of the message you talked about, the revival that was going to take place. Uh, we have had problems, and uh, you could see, although the work is stagnating, but we're encouraged to see what God is doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. But you really gave rays of hope. I want to submit that. Uh, the message you gave about the future of this body. Particularly I was concerned about Africa. And you made it clear God will revive Africa. This body will be great. And this reminded me of a scripture, I think. Uh, if I'm not, I can't open any. Uh, one the scripture here in, uh, I quote it down here, in is. Let me get my glasses. Uh, in, in, in the book of uh, Ezra, Ezra had problems. Ezra was going through some hard times. But in Ezra chapter 9, if I can get right there, and uh, verse 8 to 9 of Ezra chapter 9, it says, And now for a little space, 
grace has been showed from the Lord, our God, to leave us a remnant, to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. That was the hope that there would be a little reviving after going through all they went through. And this also came to my mind that God will give us a reviving after I've gone through whatever I've gone through. God has been so gracious. It says, For we were born men, yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage, but has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall. God will protect us. God will give a defense, a protection in Judah and in Jerusalem. And that gives us hope. It gives us hope because we have that understanding now that there's going to be a reviving. And when he, uh, I remember what you talked about today, our, our mission is to bring about a restoration. It's about a restoration. It's not about reformation. What are we restoring? That which was made desolate, that which was destroyed. Wonderful words were spoken here. And I want to appreciate you, Brother Singh. And he said, The devil can come in to destroy. It comes to destroy. There's been a lot of compromise, and that has weakened the body of Christ that has damaged this work. But we thank God that we have men that are seeing, that are helping us to keep that back to the original status. That is very important. And Brother Gurun, you said, where there is compromise, there will be destruction. And that's true. If we compromise this, it will be destroyed. And that's why it's my prayer that I, I would hold to that which the Lord made me understand. Because I vividly remember where I came from. And I remember how God touched me. Abraham, uh, thank you, you were talking about scales falling out of your eye to see clearly that you didn't have the keys to the kingdom. But God helped you to be part of the fellowship that has the keys to the kingdom. And on my part, I didn't understand what Brother Goodwin talked, but the Lord Goodwin, for three days, giving uh, the basic doctrines, about six of them. Brother Kizenji was there. He knows that very well. I do not understand anything. I just stayed there, but I was not understanding what he was talking about. Not that I was not hearing him, or not say, uh, uh, getting what he was saying, but it was so strange. And my mind was so blocked. My understanding was so seared that I could not understand anything. I mean, I was full of, uh, I would call it error, but 
after three days. I remember on the third day, it was a Sunday. That was the, uh, the, the day that was uh, closing his meeting. Then when he was about to be through, I'll always keep talking about this. When he was about to be through, my mind was open. And I understood. I cannot explain this to you, my brethren, how I understood, I came to understand what was preached for three days and I was not understanding. But the third day, my mind was open and I was able now to appreciate and love what was said the day one, in day one, day two, and day three. That's a miracle. I will never explain how it happened, but anyway, it happened. It happened. And that's what is encouraging me. And that's what I'm standing on. That which God helped me to understand is right rooted in my heart. That's why I appreciate this body. And God is gracious. And I believe, like the message that was going on this morning, this afternoon, God is going to impact this work with great power. We have a future. We may not really seem to be a people that has a future, but we have a future anyway. We have to believe it. God is going to do it anyway. He's going to do it. I've given you a story how 10 people, we have a thousand gathering in our country, of a thousand out of 10 people. What happened? God made it. And God is going to do it. This morning when I came in here, looking at the congregation, I lifted up my hands. And I say, God, thank you for the great thing that is taking place. Brother Goodwin never wasted his time. God helped him to plant something in our continent we, that is going to be yet another spring of revival. 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 And one thing we have to try to remember, uh, we cannot be revived when we are just sitting. We are to be doing something. We are to have our relationship with the Father right. If we are going to see the great power of God, we are not just going to sit. We are going to live right. We are going to think right. We are going to act right. We must feel right. We must have that relationship not soured. Greater things are ahead of us. I was so touched today. But when you said, but you'll talk to the young people. Say, please, go on. Go on. And I want to say, go on, younger people. When the Lord helped us to be part of this, we were so young. But we thank God that the men of God that have been around have helped us. There's one thing that came in my mind. Uh, how do we have the young people getting the baton. It is because we have passed it to them. The order is right. The message is right. The spirit is right. Have they gotten it? But I think I, you, you, spoke, you made a statement and I thought it was right. It's right. 
and I wouldn't like to be a preacher that God has not called. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. He said, preaching, anybody can preach. But are you called? Because the called will deliver the message. That comes from one who called them. We are not called to deliver our message. We are called to deliver the message of the one who called us. And we trace back. Go and preach my gospel. But the William so doesn't have his gospel. Where he was, he had to leave and prepare now to preach his gospel of the one who has called him. And it's dangerous to operate in a place where you are not called. You made a statement and say, you can destroy the people. It's true. You mentioned of terrorists. Terrorists can come with bombs and, and uh, it blows up everybody. Also, a man, if is not called, holding the message of the one who sent him can derail God's people and destroy them. I think, was it Jesus who said, making them twice the children of the devil? It's a destruction. Because you are giving them something that is poisonous. It's like uh, bring out poison. I believe that a message that has not been given by God, if not, somebody's not careful, can be destroyed. I said, may God help me. I need to find out, am I called? If I'm, I, if I'm called, then what am I delivering? And that's why it's very important for the young people to get a message from the man that has been called. That would be a right passing on the baton. If not, then what will come is there came a generation that didn't know God after the departure of Joshua. May God help us. Uh, Brother Gurin said, you, uh, you have to keep running. Don't wait for the baton, but keep running and to get you there. I, I got it. I say, as a young person, I need to be prepared. I need to be serious. I need to be devoted. I need to be committed. I, mean, I need to be loyal to the ministry and I have to work faithfully, waiting on the time when the Lord will give me the button. And when I get it, I'll hold it. And I'll run with it. I'll not change. I'll not, I mean, go to the left or go to the right. I'll go forward. Because the person that gave me the baton never went right or left. He went forward. He gave a straight message. He gave a straight doctrine. He gave us a bright order. He gave us the right spirit. And we must now run with that. We are not going to change. We are not going to go right or left. We must hold on. We must hold on. We must hold on. This is precious that we should not joke with it. And this remind me, when David, David was supposed to have built a house for God, and uh, the Lord said, you will not build a house for me, but your son will build a house for me. When David got that, he did a job. He prepared his son. He didn't just sit back. No, he prepared his son to take over the job of building the house. And I remember here, if you can 
Uh, permit me in uh, First Chronicles chapter uh, 28 and verse 9 David instructed his son he did a job he not produced the son and lived there and wait on that son to build, but he had to instruct the son how to build, what to use. Then it says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts, and understandest all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will be cast, uh, he, he will cast thee off forever. Was instructing. Okay, fathers, you have instructed us. What we have, we got it from you. And one thing that has helped us is we held it the way you held it. We didn't, we didn't do our own thing. Looked at the young people singing here. Thank you, Brother Goodwin. They are instructed. They are taught. They have been prepared to take over. Without that, then we have no future. But why we have the future, you said, is because the young men have got it. The young people have got it. And that's why there is a future. And that's the strength of the church. And this body has the future because we have a great percentage of young people. We are glad. That for fathers, even if you go off the scene, they are men. That God will take over this and will run with it till Jesus comes. Then, then David gave us uh, uh, verse uh, 11. Then David gave to Solomon his son. Look at this, the pattern. He gave the pattern. Where did he solo, David get the pattern? He says, of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner pillows thereof and of the place of the mercy seat. Then verse 12. And the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit. That makes a difference. It makes a difference. That's why I agree with you, brother. Think God must call you. When he calls you, he gives you the pattern. And when you hold to that pattern, you will not lead astray. You will not derail. You will not weaken. And a preacher that gives something that is contrary to the order, to the way, to the spirit, weakens the people. They may not be weak. Uh, naturally, but they are weak in the spirit. So much that they cannot tell the difference. And like you are saying, they may not know that they are in the world even. They are already weak spiritually. They are in the world, but they don't know that they are in the world. Because what has been given has weakened them. 
May God help us. He said, the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof. And then in verse um, 19, and all this David said, the Lord made me understand in a writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. So, build on that. Use that. I got it from the Lord, said by the Spirit. And our fathers, you gave us that. But I give Goodwin gave us that. Appreciate Brother Glenn Goodwin holding on to that and giving us that. We appreciate. Brother Richard, we appreciate that. For hold on to that pattern. And when Solomon did exactly like that, he also had the pattern that the Father gave him. He also worked and put together what he was uh, going to use to build the other temple. And God magnified Solomon. The scripture tells us, and the Lord in chapter 29 and verse uh, 25 the scripture says, and the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. That's the future of the church. If we have a Solomon who holds the pattern of, the, of David, then the Lord will magnify the church. I pray, may God touch God's men, work and hold to the pattern so that this church, the body of Christ, can be magnified. Today, it is down. Today, it's hard even to recognize. Where I live, they may not... Very few that recognize that I'm building into the body of Christ. But if I hold like Solomon held, one day it will be magnificent. The future of this church is great. Let's, uh, let's hold on. Let's keep building. Let's keep working. Let's keep shedding off that which would hinder us from building what our Father gave us. Appreciate God for this meeting. Thank you, Brother Goodwin. Thank you, saints of God. Thank you for this good heart, good spirit we are feeling right here. And like Brother Memo was saying, come to Uganda. Things are different now. There is, there is there's the light of the Lord shining. And come and make it brighter. Come and make it brighter. Let the people see what they have never seen. I believe it's going to be a great meeting. I'm one of the people that believe things don't just happen accidentally. This meeting back in Africa is not just by coincidence. It is the plan of God. It is the will of God. So I'm one of the people that say, come and help us. Come and fellowship together. Come and see what our brother did, like Brother Mimi said. Something that began. When it began, Brother Kizenji, it was in a hotel. There wasn't a church. 
was just a hotel room with just a few. The majority came to contradict. They came to contest. But few, as you were, you came to receive. But see what has happened. Out of that, Africa has a future. The body of Christ has a future. Appreciate God. May God bless you. God bless you. represent the Netherlands. Uh, I just want to give a short testimony. I'm so thankful for the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for the Lord giving me a chance to be here in this service, meet with God's people, body of Christ. And uh, the Lord is so merciful to us. <laughs> My mind go back to when I was just a little boy, seven years old, and Brother Canaan's daddy and my daddy, his older brother, and, and myself went to a meeting. We were raised in the Pentecostal church, and somehow the Lord moved on our pastor and separated us from the organized Pentecostal church in Amsterdam. Not knowing what the Lord wanted in our lives, but we just, our parents just trust God that he knew what was best. Anyhow, 1947, the body, uh, a brother, Bach, many of you probably know him, heard of him. He was in Chicago, Illinois, and the brother D. Young at the time. And he got a calling to go to Holland. Anyhow, he came to Holland. And on an Easter morning, second Easter morning, Monday morning, we got on the train, the four of us, and we went to help us some, and uh, to see what was going on. And I was, like I said, I was just a young child. I'd been used to Pentecost, but we went into that meeting and we well, felt a different spirit, the spirit of God. And that spirit of God touched my heart and it changed my mind, my, my uh, yeah, my mind, it changed me. I didn't receive the Holy Ghost, but he called me. I feel like the Lord called me to serve him. And I've been so blessed for these many years, oh, 71 years now, 71 years that the Lord uh, blessed me to be in the body of Christ, to meet all of God's people. I've been so blessed to meet all the ministry, a lot of the ministry. Don't know all of you by name, but the, the emotion fa faces, but I'm so thankful that I'm seeing new brothers all the time. And to have a calling to be in the bride of Jesus Christ. You know, I, we have, we've been talking about restoration. But part of that restoration is up to us as individuals to overcome our, our carnal nature and to strive to be like Jesus. And it's my goal to be like him. I want to be more like him. It's been, you know, after 71 years, 
I should have been further along than what I am. But I thank the Lord that I'm still on the job, still striving, and a goal in mind that I, I um, know that the Lord will take care of it. I got a song to sing. Sister Goodwin been asking me, where do I go here to sing? Right here. You know. Uh, now uh, my mind is blind. He wouldn't have called me if he didn't want me. Finally hit me. today search them for some peace of mind but trouble is all they found but I found peace and I found joy and happiness to find now I praise the Lord he called me called I'm his chosen child he wouldn't have called me if he did not want me he wouldn't have given his life to Calvary in vain he wouldn't have said that I could go. If it really wasn't so, he wouldn't have chosen us. If I could make it in, there are many, many people in this world today searching for some peace of mind, but trouble is all they find. But I found peace and I found joy and happiness divine. Now I praise the Lord, I heard his call. Now I'm his chosen child, he wouldn't have called me. If he did not want me, he wouldn't have given his life. Calvary in vain, he wouldn't have said that I could go. If it really wasn't so, he wouldn't have chosen me. If I could make it in, there are many, many people in this world today searching for some particular of mine, but trouble is all they find. But I found peace and I found and happiness divine. Now I praise the Lord, I heard his call. Now I'm his chosen child, he wouldn't have called me. If he did not want me, he wouldn't have given his life. Calvary in vain, he wouldn't have said that I could go. If it really wasn't so, he wouldn't have chosen me. If I could make it in, he wouldn't have called me. If he did not want me, he wouldn't have given his life. Calvary in vain, he wouldn't have said that I could go. If it really wasn't so, he wouldn't have chosen me. If I could make it in, he wouldn't have called me. If he did not want me, he wouldn't have given his life. For Calvary in vain, he wouldn't have said that I could go. If it really wasn't so, he wouldn't have chosen me. If I could make it in, he wouldn't have called me. If he did not want me, he wouldn't have given his life. Calvary in vain, he wouldn't have said that I could go. If it really wasn't so, he wouldn't have chosen me. If I could make it in, I could make it in, he 
It's good to be back in Des Moines, and we're feeling a wonderful spirit. Uh, we are grateful to the Lord that his presence is with us. <clears throat> and beyond that, we appreciate the fact that we are a knowledgeable people. We have an understanding of God's word. I pray that God's word will continue to lighten our path and that he would continue to direct us in this glorious walk. And it is a glorious walk. It's a special walk. I like the words that Brother Glenn Goodwin gave us here today. Uh, we're praying that there would be a restoration. The word revival has been bandied around quite a bit in the past. Uh, times of revival, you've read in historical accounts, uh, revival that break out in different parts of the world, the Welsh revival. Uh, it all starts with just a handful of people, people that were dedicated. I read accounts of Charles Finney in upstate New York would go into a factory and they would have to close the factory <clears throat> because of a revival would break out. And so there are things in the early church that has been lost. I appreciated what Brother Glenn Goodwin said over the years. We've seen the apostasy of the early church. <clears throat> Paul, before his decease, he said, I know that after my departure shall grievous wolves, wolves come in among you, not sparing the flock. Even of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to just draw away disciples, just to make discipleship. In Galatians, the first chapter, that was only about 17 or 18 years after the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord, <clears throat> Paul had to uh, again warn the church. He said, though we or an angel come from heaven and preach any other gospel than that which was preached, he said, let him be a curse. And he repeated that. So he was quite confident of the message that he received. By the time John on the Isle of Patmos came around, the early church was entering in the greatest period of apostasy, and we saw what that caused. Uh, the statements are very true. Uh, Moses, before he died, he said, while I'm with you, I know that you're a stiff-necked people. He said, what would you do after I'm dead and gone? And Joshua made a very profound statement. He said, choose you who you would serve. Uh, he wasn't giving them a choice between good and evil, but between two evil. But he said, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, and it is true. You get weary. You get tired. Uh, we watch as there are so many undercurrents that come in to the church, uh, the worldliness, this creeping worldliness, I like that, the creeping worldliness. People lose their desire, their passion, their zeal, their diligence, the fervency that one time marked <clears throat> the work of God. And it's sad because when Christ returned, it wouldn't be half goat and half sheep. And it wouldn't be half tear and half wheat. There will be clear distinction. You're either going to be a tear or wheat. You're going to be a sheep or a goat. There is not going to be any fuzzy lines. And I don't like the term, there's a thin line, you know, gray line. Uh, there's going to be either or. Uh, come, you blessed of my father, enter into the kingdom of our God. That I look forward with anticipation <clears throat> to that day. And I just saw the title of a book years ago. It was written by a Texan. He wasn't a Christian. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, the title is, There's Nothing in the Middle of the Road But Yellow Lines and Dead Armadillos. <laughs> so there's no way to come in the middle of the line. You get shot from both sides. You either are one side, or in you, you're on the other side. Another Texan by the name of Ross Perot said, <clears throat> he said, uh, when you see a snake, 
You don't appoint a commission to investigate if it's venomous. You kill it first, and then you can decide later <laughs> if it was venomous or not. Well, we have a message. Jude, in his little epistle, talk about contending for the faith, which was once delivered onto us. And it's amazing that Jude seems like he was copying from Peter, Second Peter. I think the second chapter, if I can look at it very quickly, here in Second Peter, I pray that we will not get caught up with the, with the uh, activity of sin, materialism, all that would draw us away from God. Uh, sin is very busy and very aggressive. Uh, sin, at one time, people would be ashamed to, uh, to be involved in certain things, even to, for the community to know. I grew up in a society that divorce was very rare, and there weren't very many Christians. Uh, divorce was unheard of. It's sad that today we see that Christians are equally bad as far as divorce versus the world. And then because of all of, of that, we see how sin has taken uh, a very prominent position uh, where our laws are being passed to promote and to accommodate it. Uh, Jesus didn't die on the cross to... to uh, give me the liberty to sin, he liberated me from sin. I am to uh, deny self, walk in the light. So Peter said here, in <clears throat> chapter 2 of Second Peter, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, uh, and bring upon themselves self-destruction. You can read the entire chapter. It talks about what God did to Lot, uh, what happened in the pre-flood uh, times. But verse 10 says, But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And these as natural brute beasts, in verse 12, are made to be taken and destroyed. The pulpit has to be strong. The pulpit has to be clear. The pulpit has to send proper signals and messages. And there is no way that I can stand and, and be a Hananiah. You know, there are a lot of Hananiahs. Uh, Jeremiah was a man called of God. You know the story how he was called. He was given a message. God told him that he would be a prophet. Every time he walked down the street, uh, he had judgment in his mouth. Uh, the people were sinful. They had terrible uh, behavior and actions. And Jeremiah keeps reminding them that they're going to go into captivity. For 70 years, they'll be taken into captivity. They'll be gone. They had to uh, be judged. And no one believed him. Uh, he told them to go build houses. Plant uh, your crops there. Uh, raise families because you're going to be there for 70 years. No one believed him. Hin and I came in behind him and said, not so. It's not going to be like that. You're only going to be gone for two years. Uh, the prophet that prophesied smooth things, a wonderful and a horrible thing happened in the land. The prophets uh, prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule uh, by their words. Uh, they, it's terrible. And so, you know the story? Jeremiah said, because you've taught this people to trust in a lie. Uh, I like what Brother Singh said, that uh, it would be terrible if I am not called to the ministry and I'm preaching. It's <laughs> worse than uh, committing terroristic acts because here we're preparing, as Paul said in Hebrews, he said, this is the place where the spirits of just men are being made perfect. We're coming to Mount Zion, where the spirits of just men are being made perfect. Uh, it's, uh, it would be terrible if we can just hear stories and, and there's nothing uh, deep. And, and I, again, I like the message here today. 
uh, this slow uh, uh, insurrection that comes in, and, and you see that in the church world. Now it's about strobe lighting, and, and it's uh, theatrics. It's uh, a lot of stage crafting. People are on audience. They go to church. Uh, you have to entertain uh, the uh, church. Uh, no one wants to be serious. Uh, this is a measured place. It's not like everywhere else. Uh, God said that, uh, rise up and measure the temple of God and them that worship therein. We are not like everybody else. We shouldn't try to be like everybody else. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Few there be. Many will say unto me that in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Jesus would look to them and say, I never know you. Depart from me, you that worketh iniquity. And Jesus warned us in Matthew, the 24th chapter. He said, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We need to have churches where uh, churches where truth is being declared and preached. And we would be unafraid. We will not be intimidated when God give a witness with a power like he gave to Jeremiah a word. Jeremiah was unafraid. He, he just took that message. He was confused for a moment because Hananiah was classified as a prophet. Hananiah, the Bible tells us, and the prophet Hananiah came in. And Jeremiah said, the will of the Lord be done. Maybe I made a mistake. But he went home, came back with a message fortified that you break the yoke of wood, but God's going to make a yoke of iron. A judgment is coming upon this land. And uh, Solomon, who was being prepared uh, to take over the kingdom, do you know that Solomon violated every one of the uh, principles in Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter? Uh, by the time Solomon died, uh, the kingdom split between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jer uh, uh, Solomon was the wisest man that lived. He was uh, wealthy. He was a man of wisdom. He was the son of David. He was being groomed uh, to do the work of God. And before you know it, one of the first things he did, he married uh, Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, for the first 20 years of his uh, kingdom, he did well. But uh, uh, thereafter, he, he, uh, many women came into his life. He built altars. Uh, child sacrifices occurred. And the scripture tells us that before Solomon died, when he died, uh, or before he died, he did evil. Solomon did evil. The same man that Jesus said, among those that were born of women, there was none wiser. But Solomon did evil in the sight of God. The kingdom of God, uh, the nation of Israel was split. It never recovered. It never recovered until uh, first Israel the ten tribes uh, was taken into captivity, and the house of Judah thereafter was taken into captivity. Uh, it wasn't until 1948 that Israel became a national uh, 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 a nation identified again as uh, the, the children of God, a, a city, Israel. Uh, it's, it's amazing. We have to be careful. If Solomon could be are caught in that deception. What about us? What about you and me? Where are we? What do we stand on? How easy could the devil uh, come in? When Jesus was about to leave uh, this scene after his resurrection and guided uh, the disciples to go to the upper room, he told them, he said, you wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. You will receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Something happened on the day of Pentecost that take ordinary men, just fishermen, unintelligent men, and men that were not schooled, men that were not taught in the council. They were not a part of the Pharisee movement, nor the Sadducee movement. They were not the intelli intelligent group. They were fishermen, a motley a group of men. But God touched them. And those men took Jerusalem by storm. Those men were anointed. They were not intimidated. And they took the streets of Jerusalem that the authorities were confused and said, where did they get all of this knowledge? Where did they get it? 
Where did they get all of this understanding? When the power of God comes upon the church. When the Spirit of God, and I'm not talking about a little gibber and a jabber. I'm talking about the real power of God that came on the day of Pentecost. I'm not talking about just an ordinary uh, shaking and a, a little bit of movement and a little bit of dancing of it, you know, that kind of action. I'm talking about the power of God, the same power that will fall upon the church. In Revelation, the 11th chapter, it tells us that God will give power unto his two witnesses when God empowers the church individuals will come in and they can have sudden conversion you know how much could be done just by a touch of God in someone's life it will avoid so many hours of counseling it would avoid so many counseling sessions. True. Have you talked to people and you think they get it? Have you ever sat down with people and you think now they got it? Only to find out later they didn't really get it. And you get confused because you thought you're doing the right thing and you're giving them the right counsel. But they wouldn't listen. We need that power. I don't mean that we don't have the move of the Spirit of God, and we're glad that we can gather here. We're waiting for that moment. The same moment I've heard stories, and that's what I like. I've never met Brother William Saunders. I've heard stories where he was praying for one woman because she became dumb. She couldn't speak. And every time he prayed for her, he said, I'm not getting through. Something is wrong. Is there something you want to tell me, sister? <laughs> she couldn't speak. And then all of a sudden, she asked for a pen and paper, and she's writing, and say, she committed a, a sinful act. Brother Sarah said, when she made that statement in writing, he prayed for her, and the power of God came upon that woman that couldn't speak, and something happened. It happened here in America. Things happen here in America. Brother Singh and I come from a country where we're, we were culturally backward in terms of our background, paganism, Hinduism. My family background was Hinduism. Madrasi, I had both sides, Hindu and Madrasi, and uh, uh, all of the chants and all of the functions that you've seen occurred only to realize that when Christ came into your life, the difference it made. Sure did. Amen. Amen. My life changed. My life changed. My life changed. I was the first one in the entirety of my family. A young man, 16 years old, crossed the path of Brother Singh and a little church, a Pentecostal church called the Full Gospel Fellowship. And I got saved there. Didn't really have any knowledge. In high school, they did a little bit of the gospel. They call it the synoptic gospels. I knew of Matthew. I knew of Mark. I know of Luke, I know of uh, uh, John, I knew Matthew, I knew John, I don't know the content. I just knew the four Gospels by name. But when I came in to a church and I heard a message, it shook me, it changed me, a young man preparing to go to further my studies. I had a lot of ambition because it would be the ticket out of poverty. Raised up in a home where my father was an alcoholic 24-7. Hard life. My sisters will tell you, difficult. We had it harder than they did. But I'm glad when Jesus came into my life. 
And more than that, I'm glad when I came into the body of Jesus Christ. I'm glad when Brother Singh came to Guyana with a message, a different message than anything that I've heard before. And when I first came here in 1984, first time I was getting a U.S. visa, it's not like nowadays you get visas easily. Back then, when you get a visa, it looked like you found diamond. Yes. I tried five times telling them the truth every time that I'm just going for a meeting. I, I wasn't married then. Uh, uh, three times I wasn't married, uh, up to the fifth time, then I got married. Uh, but they deny me every time. Uh, you don't have enough economic ties to return back to Guyana. So the sixth time I decided to pull an Abraham. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> I said, I'm telling them the truth all the time. They were not giving me a visa. So I decided to give them a whole set of lies. And to my surprise, he said, come back at 3 o'clock. I got six months visa. Came to New York. I didn't know how I was going to come to Des Moines. But there was, I don't know, Brother Antoine, if you were in New York, but brother, there was a Haitian brother from Brooklyn named Artist. And we started with a van that was supposed to have 18 passengers. It had 22. <laughs> we were bound to fail. In Pennsylvania, it seems like you're not <clears throat> getting out of Pennsylvania. If you can get past 80 from Pennsylvania, if we get past into Ohio, it's good. And I'm telling you, halfway into Pennsylvania, the vehicle, the engine died. We're leaving to come, and in those days, the meeting starts at Friday night. I was not licensed to drive here. I could drive, but I was not licensed to drive, so they had to rent three cars. And I was one of the drivers. To get into Des Moines, we drove in here 6 a.m. Saturday morning. But I'm telling you, when I pull in here, the first person I saw was a young man named Paul Jepson. We were tired and beaten, driving all night to come here. But to me, this was heaven on earth. I finally made it. I was so excited. I've heard so much about this place. I was so happy, and the first chorus that they were singing was, Jesus, fill me with your spirit. And I was sitting right there, Brother Singh. Tears began to run down my cheek because I finally made it where my heart was longing to be. I've heard so many good things on the tapes, the history of this fellowship. And Brother Singh did an exceptional job for the short period of time that he was in Guyana. And he taught us well. But when I came here and finally we were able to come in 1986 and then sent to New York, it was again like heaven and earth was kissing. It was, I was so happy and excited. I was overjoyed that I'm a part. I don't feel like I am somewhere else. And I've had the opportunity of visiting some of our brothers overseas, and I, I'm so glad, so excited. Uh, so excited to be a part of this fellowship. So, should we let this materialistic, ungodly, sinful, damnable culture, the sinful actions of individuals where sin is being legislated, just because it's legislated doesn't mean that it's right. Amen. Where abortion is nothing today, where in a country that was founded on Christian principles. Now you don't know which bathroom you belong to. Male, female, and there are some that are confused. They don't belong to male, they don't belong to female, 
So you have to have a third option. Huh? It. it. New York City, we have a, a very smart mayor by the name of de Blasio. Now you don't, when a child is born, you can put X. Canada yeah. led the way. Yes, we did. Amen. <laughs> they don't want you to identify gender identity. God has given us a little window. Look, I'm not involved in politics, but God has given us a little window in this country. We have to take the opportunity. That's it. That's it. Because I don't know who the next president will be. Amen. Forgive me. At least there's a little check. I don't think this one is really a converted man, but at least he's more favorable to Christianity, we can function with more freedom. Amen. Amen. The restrictions that will come, it's terrible. The land, the scripture tells us it will reel to and fro like a drunkard. And the earth will spew out its inhabitants. God speaking, but there's the world hearing, judgment here and judgment there, and judgment there, all over the world. But are they hearing? We can't wait until it comes into the church. We ought to pray that God will cover us and, and, and help us. Paul talks about the time when uh, he said, would to God that you would bear with me a little bit in my folly. Do you think Paul was foolish? Was he speaking language? So that to make himself look like an idiot, he said, I pray that you will just bear with me a little bit in my foolishness. Why did he say that? He was warning them. He didn't want them to be beguiled by the devil like Eve was. And he talked about how men were transformed, the workers of iniquity. Satan's ministers were transformed into angels of light. Even the devil himself was transformed into an angel of light. We ought to take heed. The ten virgins, I know, we talk about wise and foolish, but they all slept. And the warning before the, the, the ten virgins was watch and pray. Matthew 24, it's leading up. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. At the end of the parable, it says, therefore watch. They were all sleeping. They were all virgins. We got to be careful, too, that we don't get caught up. And we want to copy. We want to copy what the world has. Look, I don't live in a great city, and there's struggles. I have daily and weekly and challenges. But one thing I'm determined to talk about is the ugliness of sin. One thing I'm determined to talk about is that sin will bring pain and it will bring suffering. And Jesus came 2,000 years ago to liberate us from sin. He came to set the captives free. He came 2,000 years ago to liberate me. Sin is ugly. Sin brings a lot of hellish situation. It brings devastation. It brings desolation. It, 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 it's horrible. And I'm determined to talk about it. Because I know what the Lord did for me. I don't want to go back into that old lifestyle. I don't want to go back in that old lifestyle. In Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, it talks about a one that was born and the navel was not cut and uh, uh, was cast out into the potter's field. This uh, unredeemable 
couldn't recover from this field of pottery, broken pottery. After you fire it and it's broken, you can't mend it. But someone passed by and said, live. But you know the sad part of that chapter was that same picture that was presented after it now was beautiful, time of love, went right back to the old lifestyle. Amen. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. I know the world would love to take me back. And I know I have issues in my own life, but I know that I'm on the right track. And I know that I have a race to run. I know that I like to finish this course. Paul said, I press towards a mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. Paul didn't want to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I am crucified unto the world. The world is cru crucified unto me. He said, I don't want anything. I don't want to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Here was a man that gave us half of the New Testament, but at his first answer, no man stood with him. He said, this thou knowest, that all they that were in Asia be turned against me. Here was a man, firm. He had an experience on the road to Damascus. This man was on his way to kill Christians, but God met him on the road to Damascus. Even Ananias was confused when the angel of the Lord told him that there's one Paul coming. I want you to baptize him. Ananias said, Lord, you probably didn't hear uh, the latest news about this guy. May I inform you that he's a killer of Christians. Please, Lord, don't ask me to do this. And the Lord said to Ananias, go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel. And the commission given to Paul, he said, and I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Three times, 39, beaten on his back. He was waylaid. I mean, you name it, every issue Paul confronted. He was cast over a, 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 a wall in a basket. He was being threatened so many times. But Paul, you couldn't turn him. You couldn't turn him because he had a genuine conversion. He had an experience that could not be questioned. He was determined to make it to the end. He said, I have finished my course. He said, I have kept the faith. He said, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not only for me, but everyone that love his appearing. Hallelujah. Do you love his appearing? Are you looking forward for his second coming? Are you looking forward for the time when the curse will be lifted? Are you looking forward when the lion and the ox will eat straw together? When the earth will be covered with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea? They'll need a molest. They'll need a hurt nor molest in all my holy mountain. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward for that day. I'm looking forward for that day. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day when we don't have to pop another pill. Amen. When you don't have to go for frequent physical. You don't have to go for frequent physical. And they tell you, oh, this is high. This one is not so right. And the first thing the doctor would tell you, I have to put you on this drug. And he wouldn't tell you all of the downside to the drugs. I mean, I'm telling you, saints. And this body is not getting better. It ages, we get slow, sure we get weak, yeah. we get tired. But I am looking forward for the day when I'd be clothed with a new body. For in this body I groan, waiting, 
We have this treasure in earthen vessel. But we're waiting for that day. We're waiting for that day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's reject the world. Let's keep ourselves from the world. Let us keep ourselves pure. Every man that has this hope purified himself even as he's pure. The Lord direct your heart into the patient waiting for Jesus Christ and set your affections on things above and not on things below. For all that is in this world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And none of that will go beyond the grave. All of our successes, it ends at the grave. Yes. It ends at the grave. You're not taking one penny. Amen. You're not taking one certificate beyond the grave. I don't see Jesus' kingdom is going to have a wall full of certificates and, and all of the successes that you have. These are the words you're going to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servants. But he said this. John said this, but he that do it, the will of God, will abide forever. Amen. It's good to be here. Praise God.
Sometimes we would go on another 20 or 30 minutes, but I just feel like this is a good point in the service. This has been a good day. <laughs> the scripture says this is the day the Lord has made, that we'll be glad and rejoice in it. And I've been rejoicing today, this day that the Lord's given us. Again, thankful for everyone who's traveled, some nearby, some traveled thousands upon thousands of miles, flew hours upon hours from the other side of the world to be here, and we're just thankful for everyone who's come. Most of all, I'm thankful for the covering of the Holy Spirit of God, His presence, His covering. He's the one who can, who can make this holy ground. You know, you could go over into the Sinai Desert today where, and you could even find the spot where once there was a burning bush, but it's not holy now. But when God's power was there, when God's presence was on that bush, when it burned and never was consumed, Moses, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. And it was God's presence that sanctified and made it holy. And oh, that the Lord's presence here tomorrow, tomorrow night, and Sunday, just make this a holy convocation. Paul said we've been uh, raised up together. He said we've been made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus in Ephesians 2. So anyway, it's been wonderful. Uh, tomorrow, service starts at 11 o'clock in the morning. We'll serve breakfast in the fellowship hall from, from 8.30 until 10. And uh, service at 11 and then again at 7 o'clock tomorrow. I think after service tonight, for all the young people, the single young people and the young marrieds between ages 13 and 30 to have an opportunity for good godly fellowship back in the fellowship hall and some food and good time together and I think that's nice. They're all welcome for that. We just want to, I think it's just good maybe if we offered the Lord a great big thank you, if we offered thank him you. praise for what he's done for us. Thank you, Lord thank you. God. Thank you. We appreciate you. We appreciate your mercy and thankfulness for what God has done. Pray that you continue to be with us, that you cover us and keep us through the rest of this meeting, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. May the God of all grace shine his face upon you. We'll see you tomorrow. Amen.